Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Books and Bridges, a humanities institute of ideas and conversation. We explore the wisdoms of the world and apply them to modern life. Whether through literature, philosophy, or history, we promote searching sincere dialogue across the human spectrum and value the beauty and depth it brings to our public interactions. As a community of learners, we cultivate in each other the aspiration toward truth, goodness, and beauty. Tonight, we examine the universe within and the universe without and ponder the connection between the two, how our values, presumptions, sensibilities, and expectations create the frame of possibilities for existence. We cannot help but ask, are the rules of the universe fixed and final? Is human progress moving towards some endpoint where we all stop and rest? Or is the universe a radical adventure of ceaseless and open activity that does not and cannot culminate in anything ultimate? The answers we choose do matter. They shape our course, even if they can't be universalized. The philosopher and psychologist William James wrestled with these questions for more than a century. And the implications have both inspired and unsettled us ever since. Here to point us to greater light is our friend and guest, Charles Randall Paul. Dr. Paul received a BS in social psychology from Brigham Young University and an MBA from Harvard. After a short career as a commercial real estate developer, he received a PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, writing a dissertation on methods for contesting irresolvable ideological conflicts. Paul is the founder and president of the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy that aims to build trust and goodwill between religious critics and rivals. He has produced a documentary film on religious rivalry in America. Paul has also lectured and organized heart and mind conversations in Europe, Russia, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and China. So Dr. Paul, I turn the time over to you. Uh, you and I may have a little bit of back and forth um, conversation during your presentation, but for the most part, you'll present for about 30, 40 minutes. And then after that, everyone can submit questions through Q&A. So take it from here. Thank you very much. It's really a, a delight uh, to have this invitation from you, my friend. I'm going to uh, launch right into this book report. The book we're going to be discussing tonight is called A Pluralistic Universe. It was the last um, lecture that William James gave, gave before he died. He went to Oxford and... Uh, gave a lecture on the state of philosophy in which he put forth, if you will, a summation um, of his entire life's conclusions in a very short few uh, lectures. So I, I, would, I would admonish anyone who's interested in the thought of William James to buy this book, including uh, get the one um, that is... Uh, called the uh, 1996 version, Bison Books. It includes three appendices that James put at the end of his lectures that are crucial to, I think, understanding some of the things he was saying about uh, the reality that he was trying to express as plural. Um, as I begin, I want to say uh, that Mark Twain's wife is, in trying to cure his profanity, resorted to the tactic of imitation. And Twain replied, you have the words, my dear, but not the tune. I want today to, if anything, inspire my listeners uh, to, to some sense of the tunes that William James had in his thought. He was perhaps the most um, eloquent philosopher of his time in trying to speak to the common people, educated folks, but he was out on the circuit as a, as a modern intellectual trying to influence thinkers in, in his society because he felt that in his deepest experience, what we'll be talking about, philosophy should have legs in the lives of common folks or it wasn't worth doing. And I think 
as you read this book, there'll be points where you're going to find it gets a little dense because you're not so familiar with the history of philosophy yourself that he was ad addressing. But if you plod through them, you know, dig through Leviticus, but don't miss Genesis, you know, go through the parts of Isaiah that you can't get pass over them, but go to the gems, you know, read Job, read, you know, read Amos. If you can't dig through the other stuff. In other words, this text is very rich and I want to encourage you. I hope tonight to to try to dive into it, not just listen to me gab for an hour. Um, I am so enthusiastic about William James and his thought. He's deeply influenced me. I'm I'm almost uh, feeling like a um, a crazy man who should be on the corner of your town with this book in my hand, saying, "Read it. The end is coming. Read it before it's too late." You know, a pluralistic God is going to save the world, not the old classic one that was was stuck forever on a throne someplace distant from us. Yeah. So if, if you feel that evangelism in me, it was certainly part of James. He would applaud it because he felt the pragmatic reality of philosophy had been so lost over the years in what he called mere intellectualism or rationalism. He, he was trying in his work and everything he did to say, hey, there is no difference that makes no difference. And so everything that I'm talking, trying to say should make a difference in your life that's positive. If it doesn't, chuck it and, and, and don't listen to me. And so uh, I would hope the same uh, tone um, or tune would come through tonight. Uh, I want to then give you some background first of all, on William James. He he died, as I said, I think in, in 1910. Um, he lived during the Civil War, was a young man, could not go into the war because he was sick, always regretted that, felt like his brother had really lived life by going, as he said, where the bu bullets whistled by his ears. You know, this will give you a sense of, of William James. He, he felt he was a wimp. And as it compared to those who had really gone there. On the other hand, he lived no wimpy life. He was a deeply depressed guy. He had what we might call today a clinical uh, depressions at times. And uh, everything I think he writes uh, faces the reality of uh, a life that was causing him grief and what he, how he would respond to that grief. There was one moment in his life where he was in France, where he was educated and by his, his father had taken the family, the, uh, Henry James is his brother and, and Alice was his, it. Was, long story short, they're a very accomplished family. He took them to Europe a lot. And at one point when James was in his formative years, he went to an asylum in France and he came on a floor where he saw a man in the corner, partly naked, hoveled down and stinking and just staring off. And as James looked at him, he had what might be called a psychic experience himself, a psychological tremor went through him. He saw himself as possibly that man. And it so shook him that he couldn't throw it. And for many months, it became a, a deep agony in his life as he faced what we might now call the existential reality of what might be, of what might have happened to him, what might tomorrow happen to him or anybody. So James, though, he came through a life uh, initially looking at art, didn't find it there, looking at medicine, didn't find it there, looking at psychology, finding it there, finding the it, his interest, in, where you've got uh, the, the most intellectual and uh, practical interest, and finally moving from psychology into philosophy. And at the toward the end of his life, the philosophy of religion became his most interesting uh, aspect as he, he's, as he visited his own beliefs about what might be beyond the mechanistic world that a lot of his friends believed in, right? Of just atoms bumping into atoms in a purposeless, purpose, purposeless 
universe that would come from nothing and end up going away. Um, so I want to give that background uh, of the man who uh, uh, ended up living a very interesting and powerfully uh, intellectual life, but who was also a very strong feeler of that life. And that pervades all, all his psychology and his philosophy. I, uh, I put together a couple of things here that, to, for background. And I'll just read them for a minute. The 19th century was a crisis in foundationalisms and authorities and certainties that led to the 20th century explosion in contests for superiority in arts and sciences and ethics and culture. We had World War I and II and uh, all sorts of conflicts that continued. While most of our listeners will not know the history very well, it is important to grasp that William James' philosophy of pragmatism was an effort first launched by Charles Peirce, a friend of James, to continue intelligible and communication across different metaphysical positions to avoid wild anarchy of thought and culture on the one hand and balkanization into incommensurate philosophical or aesthetic camps on the other. The 19th, early 19, 19, 1900s was a very fast moving time, not on, unlike our own time. Things were really moving fast. And the, uh, well, I'll just continue onward here. Paris introduced William James to think about a practical method for engaging in the contest over irreconcilable philosophical, idealistic, and religious conflicts that had real world ramifications. James did not become a metaphysical pragmatist like Paris, who was a monist, but attempted to explain how pragmatism provided a way of communication about truth and purpose between parties with no common metaphysical or epistemological or religious foundation that they shared. They could look together at purposes they wanted to achieve and compare the effectiveness of their methods for achieving those purposes. In this, they were alike. So he, William James as a philosopher, was not out trying to find the metaphysical final truth like so many other philosophers. He had already faced what he concluded was the impossibility of, a, of achieving a consensus on whatever the truth was and saw that what he could provide was a method for engaging the continual contestation over what truth was and what where it might lead us. And he did that by saying, essentially, what really matters to most human beings is the purposes they're trying to accomplish, the desires and purposes they're trying to accomplish. And for him, therefore, truth could best be determined ex post facto by saying, did you accomplish the purpose you were trying to accomplish? And so for him, the pragmatic way was a method of, of eliciting from people what they found their deepest ideals were, what their deepest purposes were, and whether they were finding ways of accomplishing those effectively in the world. That was what his philosophy was trying to do. It was not getting at truth, but allowing people to engage over these questions with this idea that truth was a pragmatic working out of accomplishing goals that uh, you deeply came to desire. If and I so, may chime uh, in real fast. Yeah, go ahead. Did he, did he propose any kind of metric by which a successful um, accomplishment of, of one's religious aims could be measured? He would say that the, that there is no, he would, he would be very congenial with Rene Girard's idea of the interdividual. There is no radical separate person or individual that could have any kind of intelligible, intelligible existence without others to, to create a social environment. Therefore, 
that to say that you are not part of an organized religion is almost to say like you're not part of an organized humanity you know you what what are you 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 have a you have a common group of people that try to find out what they might believe together and they say let's drive down the road on the right okay that's our religion we're going to drive down the road on the right in other words you for him the question is not um whether you have goals everyone has goals the, the question is whether or not you have them alone oh everyone has them in groups and so then the question becomes for him always well what are your highest ideals what are your highest ideals i want you to tell me it's interesting that you drive on the right but do you stop for people who are in trouble on the road and if so why you know, it's, it, you know, it, it, or are you trying to de de develop cars that fly instead of just driving? I want to know what your group finds is the most high, inspiring, motivating purpose. And then he would compare groups and say, that's their religion. It's what drives them or their common purpose. And so, yes, to answer your question, he would say, are they getting the job done? Are they accomplishing their purposes? And uh, we could talk about various religions and how that really uh, would interplay with, with the, the adherence of that religion. And that would be always a, a practical question to ask them, how's it going, right? And it's ask them as a group. So I hope that was a useful way. So it could be susceptible to to progress, to a kind of progressive narrative where the accomplishment could be in development in. in yes, um, I, I, you're in pushing progress right being, to one of my points yeah. that we're going to make later, but I'll make it now because uh, I'd rather have a conversation with you anyhow than go through a, a script. Um, the One of the keys to radical pluralism is is the idea, in fact, let me step back. I'd like everyone who's listening to imagine what you probably frequently think about, if not believe, which is there is ultimately an overarching reality that everything will ultimately harmonize under this overarching reality. Or to say it another way, there's ultimately a foundation down there upon which everything that's real rests. And ultimately, that foundation holds. James would say, that's an interesting belief. I don't believe it. And you and I can disagree and neither of us can prove it, can we? But what difference would it make to say, there is no ultimate overarching harmony? As James would say, there might be many gods who disagree, which immediately blows off the, the cover of a classical idea of God, which is the ultimate being or entity that, that is outside of time and space, that is certainly not a person, but is some kind of organizing, ultimately harmonizing thing out there that is the real and that glues everything together. James would say, that's... that's I don't see any evidence for that. I know that that gives you comfort because right now, if you look around the world, it's messed up. You're messed up. You don't even know who you are and you change as you grow and you don't know who your friends are. I mean, everything's, there's wars and there's this and there's that. There are religions that come and go. And there are people that disagree about religion within the religion. There's nothing solid. So he came out of it, remember the 19th century where, where the uh, goal of, of certainty of the, that was you know, the Enlightenment's goal for 200 years was finally being trashed as uh, an impossibility. In fact, we could say that phenomenology at, toward the beginning of the 20th century was the last gasp effort to say there is certainty be, you know, between human beings. And we just know it. And you know it by the phenomena of knowing that, it, it, that everything is certain. And of course, that hasn't satisfied many people. So we, we came to the end of the road in philosophy. And James, having faced that, started to think about what God would be like and why he didn't believe in a God that had set up the world in, in such a way that it seemed so imperfect and, and messy 
and he didn't go with Leibniz, where it said God has done the best possible world he could, and by definition, this is it. James would say, ah, I think I could have done better. <laughs> you know, giving me time, giving you time, giving us time. In other words, he he was radically, if you will, uh, impious for the classical God, but radically, and here's important, pious for a God who was less than fully perfect, but was doing the best job he could to enlist us all as helpers in improving the universes that, that, that are out there that God's involved with. And, and he said later in his life, in this book, he said, whether it's polytheism or not, I have no problem overthrowing the old idea that, that many gods is somehow more primitive thinking than one God, right? He said, let's chuck that. That's, that's, a, that's a bias that needs to be dumped. It doesn't, it doesn't add anything to say that there's one versus many, in fact, and he goes into the argument. Now, uh, and so I'm, I'm going on with, uh, at length about his theology toward the end of his life because um, he was very concerned that what he called the block universe, where nothing really mattered, all was fixed and final already, it was just only apparently important to us that everybody was fated to be where we are. He just, as a human being as a, and as a psychologist, found that so devastating that he said it was a choice everyone had to make. An aesthetic, he called it an aesthetic or a temperamental choice to say, would you prefer being in a universe where it's already all fixed and final and only apparently that there are, there, are, there are problems, but ultimately everything's done. And when it's done, it's done. Finished, still, perfect, no motion, because it's final and fixed. It's, it can't be get, nothing better can happen because that's the kind of overarching reality God is, this, this perfection. Would you rather be, and does that inspire you, that end, what he called the ultimate convergence, or do you find it more inspiring to believe in ultimate fecundity, creativity, openness, including the risk that things might not go well or not as well as you want, of including risk that you can't accomplish your goals? It, among the gods as well as among humans, right? In other words, he pushed radical pluralism based on this idea of freedom to create and to make a difference was so personally important to him. And I think it came out of his depressed moment when he looked at that man in the corner and felt like that guy had been fatalistically put into the, to that position. It was so horrifying to him. He had to feel like he took the choice it's in his famous book, the, the will or right to believe. He took the choice to say, my first act of, of believing in free will is I believe in free will and I will go forward and make a difference in the universe, collaborating with the gods that are and trying to help. And uh, so he, by the way, his thought was very important to the Alcoholics Anonymous group, which took his work and his famous work in acting as if you're going to make a difference, um, relying on a, a superior power to collaborate with you, right? I can't do this by myself, but I can do something, right? You know, I, I get, James would definitely go with the old line, uh, I, I, I'm only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And that which I can do, I ought to do. And that what I ought to do by that grace of God, I will do, mm -hmm. right? And so there's this idea, not invictus, not just me doing it by myself in this nihilistic world. That's where Nietzsche goes. But he went with uh, what he felt was a more inspiring collaboration with higher powers 
that he makes arguments for as being, and this is a very important part of his work, probably the best hypothesis for reality. And in this book, you, you, you will find him making arguments that you might find quite persuasive, that all we deal with in the world is probabilities. And therefore, we look for evidence after our desires. So we, we take a hypothesis that, that there might be superhuman realities out there that might care about us and that might inspire us and, and we can collaborate with to make things more than they are now, better than they are. That's your hypothesis. You go out then and find evidence for it. You could also take the other hypothesis. It's nothing but atoms and, and mechanism out there. We didn't come from anywhere and we're not going to go anywhere. There is no purpose. You know, if, the, if he, he says that's, that's also a live hypothesis, but he makes arguments not for classical gods. He dumps all the classical arguments of God, but he makes the argument out of pragmatic human psychology that uh, there's more. One of his famous descriptions of God is M-O-R-E, more. And he will be, I think, compel all his readers to at least admit that there is both a rational and a, an empirical impetus to strongly believe in more, right? In more than you know, in more than you've experienced, and as many people today in, in, the, in the society we're in, in the West at least, uh, to believe in um, what they call the anthropic principle that if we are humans on this earth, there is probably many, many other earths that in given enough time, which apparently the universe has had billions and billions of years to do it here, well, why not elsewhere? James would say, yes, that's that's exactly correct, but not exactly as it happened here. <laughs> In other words, for him, th th this is very important for you to understand. His radical empiricism was based on the idea of experience itself being the prime uh, unit of reality. And experience would include thought, feeling, Anything that happens is, is experience. And they're there by an experient, by, a, by an entity experiencing, right? And that, um, that allowed for us to always be open to the possibilities of more revelations from scientific methods or other methods than we currently have now. We will always experience more. We, that's not, that's common sense, right? You know that as a human being, you're always experiencing more. And so he was a perspectivalist in the sense that, and a plural, plural, pluralistic perspectivalist, which is common to most of us. We are most of us understandably pluralistic perspectivalists. We know our kids don't have the same perspective we do. We have a different perspective at age 65 than we did at 13. We get that. But he was more than a perspectivalist. In his radical pluralism, he believed that there might be different kinds of discontinuous reality. Imagine, in other words, a universe where gravity went backwards, um, where there were entities that were that were not at all humanoid, but that were intelligent in some fashion. That everything we take for uniform and granted in science is itself a, a uh, merely an observation of continual repetition that can't be proved to exist every place else. And so that's why he was such a radical pluralist. 
he would allow for the possibility of there being different universes where different laws, if you will, or different formations um, than anything we would recognize here exist. Um, I just want to put that in your thought to realize how radical he went when he talked about different gods and different orders. He was really meaning that we can't put a lid on any imaginable or unimagined uh, reality that could be experienced by some entity. His only mm. thing, his only, his only limit term was if it couldn't be experienced, it wasn't real. Right. You remember you can experience, you can experience your imagination. We have a few questions from um, John Gardner and then one from Dan Witherspoon. Uh, let me just start with Dan. Dan asks, ask you to please ground these big ideas in concrete examples. I'll get to John's questions after that. Okay. Um, Dan, thanks for ask, asking the pragmatic philosopher's question. What difference does this make in concrete reality for you? And you would have to say, I'm, I'm projecting psychologically from me to other people. When I say what I'm saying, I project that what difference it's made to me is in the problem of evil and suffering that I was unable to face when I grew up. Um, I just had no, no belief anymore in a God that was so inept. For example, I, I, I found the fact that if I saw a girl walking down the street, a little girl about to be hit by a car, I, a human being, would go, hey, you know, move over. I can simply do that and save that girl's life. Would that ruin something in the great scheme of things for God to do something? to get, keep her from hitting by that, being hit by that car. This is my speaking. I know there are all sorts of rationalizations you're gonna make out there for you Orville archers who wanna harmonize everything, right? I know it's there. We don't see, we don't have the perspective to see that that little girl uh, was about to, to become an ax murderer in the next few years, you know, or that she was needed in heaven right, right then to do something, right? I know, I know all that. I'm only talking about Aunt Dan Witherspoon's question, what difference it made to me. I couldn't handle that. So when I found out that there was a way of thinking about God as, an, as a limited being who was doing the best they could to optimize the good in the universe, and that included this little girl getting hit by random chance, in my opinion. That included that. I was able to say, okay, can I then worship? Can I find a God that is less than omna, 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 worship worthy? I mean, if I'm just, what is worship? What, how can I worship a God that was just a guy with problems of his own, you know, or a gal or a family or whatever they are. And so the answer for James was for me, oh, this, these, this God was infusing humans with a desire to take part, to shout for the little girl to move over if we could to do our part to improve what God could not improve himself. And that made sense to me. It brought me back to, as, as James later says in this, in this, one of his final comments, he says that it'll, a God like this is actually allows us to understand love as something that, is 
is so complex that it can never be fully explained and that motivates us to do the good we can, even though it is inadequate to the good we desire. So it, it makes God for me worship worthy in that I can emulate the desire of a divine group of beings or superhumans who are desiring to make the universe a place more loving and enjoyable and creatively interesting for its inhabitants and hurting as few of them as possible in the process. And I bring that up now to say one of James's famous lines was, no good deed, and he would include, including by the gods, can be judged in advance. It can only be judged after you have weighed the cries and moans of the wounded in its wake. He had this idea of what you might call a tragic comic view of the universe or the universes that, that trade-offs were real that ultimate harmonization was not something to count on. It was what we're trying to do is, is ameliorate. He says he was an ameliorist. He was trying to make things better, feeling that could never be perfect because in a pluralistic world, there would be conflict over what the perfect is. This is crucial to understand. It's so hard for us to come at this idea because we have this idea of an overarching single morality that some law of the universe has set for the gods or some group of gods have set for the universe. And it's, it's just what is. And, and James would say, no, we've got to take it all the way. One moral system might impede on another moral system. One set of priorities, everyone should play the piano, might impede on the priority of everyone should play soccer. Um, and so this is what radical pluralism does in the moral and ethical context. It creates only an ameliorist effort where, yes, some will win and some will lose. And the, the only thing you can do is try to optimize it. It's an, in a little sense, it's utilitarian, but he misses on the, he doesn't buy out on a utilitarian totally because he believes that you can actually argue over what, what the good is. And Mandy, so, does that does that imply a creation that is still underway, that is is very much um, in question, in which we have a, a role to participate in? Uh, yeah, you're. I'm I'm a Latter Day Saint, and maybe a lot of our listeners are, and you're going in the direction of um, with that question, it's kind of a slow pitch down the middle to me because um, I think the idea in, in the, the Mormon tradition or church, tradition of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints melds very well with James's idea of an unfolding reality and where the Latter-day Saints are in conflict is where they have still bought into classic deism and they've never been able to feel good about saying we are all really divine beings participating together in creating what's next. You know, for us, for Latter-day Saints, the grand council in heaven was more like a state conference where everybody was half asleep going, yep, 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 yep. It wasn't a council where people were actually saying, what about this? Let's try that. What do you think about that, God? Take it on. No, no, there, there, there was, there was, that wasn't the idea. Whereas William James would say, well, then why have the council? Right? It wasn't really a council. And, and so for Latter-day Saints, we have this problem to, to redress your question. And it goes back to the theistic problem. Is the universe trying to get to some preset order or epitome, omega point, as Teilhard de Chardin used to call it, or is it always unfolding among various other possibilities? I'd like to say it. It's a universe where there is no ultimate purpose. All purposes are penultimate, and they're all collaborative, 
always in conversation with other entities, other persons who are trying to decide what to do next to optimize their highest ideals. They create, in other words, or collaborate uh, in, in creating experiential forms to optimize, and in the case of Christians, love in its highest expressions, right? Or to have abundant life or lives, as Joseph Smith uh, amended uh, Jesus's comment of abundance. He, uh, Joseph Smith made it clear. He put the S on there, right? Uh, abundant lives, eternal lives. That idea of pluralism has always been a problem because we have inherited the old idea that God is already fixed and final and perfect. And we're all trying to be like that, which is fixed and final and perfect. We're trying to correspond with that reality instead of no God is really a God of collaborative progress, continual creativity, new worlds without end, maybe not like this one, with different gravities, even different moral possibilities, different bodily forms for intelligences that could want to experience new and different things. I, 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 why five fingers? Why are five fingers the best that eternity is produced, right? Have you ever thought about that? Is this body in which God appeared for Latter-day Saints or for Christians, Jesus appeared, is this resurrected body going to be forever five fingers? Maybe an appendix not there anymore. Who knows? Um, you know, what? when you start thinking about what the purposes of an open eternal existence would be, boredom becomes the problem. The block universe that, dro that drove William James crazy becomes the problem. Most people will go, well, I'd like a little new music going on. It, you know, I'd like something happening other than just being blissfully singularly finished. And you know, so Randy, this this leads to a question that, that John Gardner asks, and you've you've answered it in part at least. He asked, Did James have a sense of a universe in which there is an ultimate order or beautiful complexity under which a consortium of deities contributed in a supernatural or transcendent way? He would say, he would say, yes, yes, that's all possible. In fact, in his mind, what you just described is probable, but it's not sure. It's just one possibility. And he said, he says the monistic possibility of convergence is also possible. In other words, he might be wrong. So he he allows that, but he tries to convince everyone that the monistic possibility is incoherent irrational even though it claims to be the most rational and both and psychologically completely devastating and so you know go with this exciting possibility of openness and the possibility of actually uh, some form of existence beyond this life a continuing of subjective what he calls immortality um to him that to go back to dan witherspoon's argument for most human beings he thinks the argument of a continued subjective reality of continuation after this life actually inspires us to the, live this life well, to improve things so that we can be better in the next round, right? Rather than to say it's all over now at the end of life, which many people find inspiring because they say, this is it, make the best of it, right? And he and James understood both arguments. He just found more compelling the one of of being something that you're 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 building on and it's exciting to be part of it because it it's going to last memories will last that the universe will not go gone but everything you do therefore matters um continuity and accumulation of yes continuity all accumulation. experience and, and the difference between the circular idea of continuity or uh that the eastern thought has where James looked at it very carefully. Um, you might call it reincarnation or karmic circles. He found that to be ultimately troubling because he found no memory, allowed no accumulation, even though there is accumulation, the idea of karma, that even though you don't know what you did wrong, you're being blamed for it now. You don't know what you did right, you're being blessed for it now. James felt that, because he was basically a personalist, by the way, that's another way of going it. He was a personalist. He felt, if, it, if you will, that reality was felt 
and thought and experienced by persons. He didn't deny that plants did it too, but plants and animals and other forms, rocks for that matter, had different complexity of experience that could not be expressed like like humans or the gods can. And therefore, for him, memory was very important. One of the first, his first book on psychology began with the first principle, which was attention. First principle of psychology for him was attention. To what does the attendee give attention? Out of all the uh, phenomena about possible around him, why do you pay, pay attention to the door that just opened and not the fact that there might be a God or, you know, or, or what, you know, he, he, his whole idea was it's at the social psychological level where experience happens that matters most to humans. And he was again talking about religions of humans, psychology of humans, philosophy of humans. There might be one for ants and there might be one for gods that are different or whatever, but he loved the idea that there was a continuity, both upward and downward, that somehow we could uh, understand a little. We we're all net for him. We're all nested. Uh, Whitehead used his ideas. Whitehead loved James, by the way. He felt he was a very profound thinker. Um, and he, Whitehead's idea of nested realities or nested entities, you know, your your kidney is nested within you. The subatomic particles are nested within atoms. You know, there are nest, there are levels of complexity or reality that all might have their own form of, if you will, consciousness. Um, but the the idea of an overall consciousness or the total consciousness being better than individual consciousnesses was for him um, unprovable and psychologically unsatisfying. To say that somehow to have a total consciousness was better than having a particular consciousness, he would not put the word better there. He would just say it's different. <clears throat> and therefore, to use his terms, there was no absolute total or all. <clears throat> All itself was always every instant being changed and increased. <coughs> and another way of saying it is, and the argument between the one and the many, the many always wins for James because all is merely another piece of the many, right? The concept of all is what he would have called a limit term that we can't actually understand if it's beyond um, anything that exists. All that exists is all experience, and that's merely a totality of experiences, which means it's a big experience, <laughs> right? If you're God and, and you, you, you understand and experience all, well, that's just another one of your experiences, Right. And so this allows God to be part of this unfolding consciousness. He didn't know whether we were, he liked Fechner's idea of levels of consciousness where the ones below weren't aware of being a part of the ones above. James' famous line in this book is we might be like dogs, dogs and cats walking around in God's library. Right. We, we can't read the books. We can see what's going on in there, but only as a dog and a cat. But God knows what's is more conscious of what we're doing. And he, he said, but for him, that didn't matter. That didn't change his world. Having that idea, um, if there was no connection, if I as a dog and cat couldn't make a matter, make any difference to God, then God became an immaterial limit term that had no active force in my life. So I had to somehow, the consciousnesses had to be somehow connected in a feeling that we were relating to each other enough to make a difference. And that difference de depended on what we desired to accomplish in the world, what we thought was our ideal, our ideal good. And so we're back in this circle. James was a teleologist, meaning what do you desire to do? What is your purpose? How does that then rationally connect with a plan 
of empirical action, right? And the truth is, do your do your purposes actually get accomplished by your actions? That's what reality is. It's ongoing. That's always ongoing. Wherever you are, that's reality. Uh, actions are real as long as they happen. And part so of the sure. action, thought, by the way, thought it's feeling. So don't get, you know, remember radical empiricism is all experiences. Let's move to a question from Jay Griffith. He says, I came to this idea of God doing the best they can from my own experience and reasoning. I'm delighted that someone of James's caliber thought this through and came to a similar conclusion. One time when I expressed this to a friend, they replied that it reflects a compassionate and merciful view I hold for myself. How would you and James frame this idea in Jesus' expression of the two great commandments, which is really three, including self, and seeing the divine in each other as we evolve? I think William James would, um, he said he was musically, uh, religiously unmusical. He never joined a church, but he came, his father was a Swedenborgian, a very strong Christian, and uh, it influenced James' thought, of course, deeply, uh, Christianity did. And uh, since I already mentioned, he influenced both Whitehead and Hartshorn um, in the idea that the, the loving desire seemed to be the highest thing that he felt in his life. And that was, he felt Jesus would, would go along with that. Right. And so I think we push back on the divine. He, he found that the divine was a, was a cop out. Right. Um, why not the divines? And what do you mean by divines? And so he, he, he would start with, okay, let's talk about love. That seems to be important to you, right? Let's, what are your, in other words, whether or not the ideal of love comes from a book you read or whatever, what are you going to do with love? That, what are you going to accomplish with it? What, what are your goals? And who are you going to collaborate with to get those goals done? If you want to, if love for you means having children and taking care of them, who, who are you going to get to marry you, right? Um, or at least these days have children with you, or maybe put in a test tube. I don't know. We could go in all sorts of directions with modern science, but I, I, I'll just say that James always would go back to what's your prime ideal? What's your prime purpose? How do you want to accomplish it? And then he'd go back and say, ah, well, a person who wanted to accomplish love of brothers and sisters in the world and people outside your tribe even, that person being a God, uh, Jesus Christ, a Messiah person, who then said you should love your neighbors as, uh, as a commandment that's just like loving God. If, if, if to you the idea of the highest is to love this perfection, this perfect being, or in his case, maybe the being who has covenanted to save you or your people, because he came out of a Jewish background, remember, his father in heaven was at that, to, to the people around him, that was, that was, I won't go into a lot of theological detail, because we only got a few minutes left, uh, but I will just say that James would look at what Jesus did pragmatically with his desire to make love of others and of God and of himself effective in the world. What did Jesus do? What did he do? What were his actions? Well, we saw a lot of what he's done in, in the gospel texts. I think Paul both helped and screwed that up a lot in conceptualizing and theology, theologi theologically um, putting Jesus's actions into a framework um, that we could talk about how those differences made a difference and very big difference in the way classical theology in Christianity came down and went where I think Joseph Smith finally corrected a lot of it. And we are in the process now in the world of a lot of thinkers who are doing process thought and the idea of, a, of an open universe are also correcting uh, something that I think allows love to be real and not just an apparent thing. Love means there has to be something other than love that's real. 
It means there has to be choice and freedom for love to be real. If you put love of God, of, of, of men, or of yourself as a high ideal, the conditions of a block universe fall to completely apart. You have to have risk. You have to have the possibility of not being loved. Even by God, you have to have the possibility of him loving you less and you putting up with it and saying, I still love you. In other words, you're in a world that is always creatively moving and love is the action of trying to ameliorate things for yourself and others in this collaboration with the with divine beings, not the divine. There might be divine beings out there who have universes where love is not the optimum solve for, right? That would be pure James. He would say, of course. In fact, we could say in the Latter-day Saint idiom, well, even in the presence of the most loving God in the universe, we had a war in heaven. He couldn't convince us that this was the ultimate value. A lot of us said, nah, no, not love. And we can we can think about that. What 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 would the story of the war of heaven be told by the, the third part who didn't go along? It certainly wouldn't but we be the story we have in our scriptures. <laughs> they would have their tale. And uh, I think uh, Milton does a great job of uh, trying to tell it uh, a little bit in Paradise Lost. But boy, this has yeah. been a great ramble. And, it's fascinating. We have a few more questions to get through, if you don't mind. Oh, I'll go on as long as they want to continue. Yeah, we can go about 10 more minutes. So Kate Jones Beggs asks, know you not that ye are gods, John 1034, she cites, the Hindu tradition acknowledges different forms and representations of the divine, all understood in their relation to the supreme being, Brahman, many gods, and one. Addressing the idea of one eternal round, if experience itself is a prime unit of reality, then the divine can only experience life through the expression of the individual. If resurrection in Christ is a now experience rather than a kingdom to come, what is our work now? I need to unpack that. I really want to, uh, dear listener, uh, who, who asked that well, question? I can, I can read it again. Oh, I think okay. this is the key. This is the, the last sentence. If experience itself is the prime unit of reality, then the divine can only experience life through the expression of the individual. If resurrection in Christ is a now experience rather than a kingdom to come, what is our work now? Well, again, I'm speaking as William James might and say, uh, again, you use the divine word there and there was an implication. I'm not saying what you believe, but there was an implication of there being um, an entity that was more real by experiencing our experience. And I am going to interpret that to say you don't believe, and it's only a question, in an entity that is having his or her own experience separate from our collective experiences. And that that experience is always open for that entity. Or if to say it, if it's a nested program, that entity might be also being experienced by other gods above that entity in an, in an infinite um, situation, which is almost impossible for us to even conceive of having multiple consciousness, right? Of having the experience at the same time of billions of people and your own experience, you know, swatting your dog in your kitchen while you're experiencing gazillions of other people. I, I think at this point, it blows our capacity to say, if that's the kind of God we think is God, then it's only conceivable as a limit term. We, we can't get that because we experience in, as James would say, 
in a stream of consciousness of little tiny pieces of experience, right? And that's reality. It's always experienced in little tiny pieces of, of motion. There is no present. There's always just this motion. And so all I can tell you there is, I think James would come back and say, that, um, what he finds inspiring is not that a being is experiencing my experience, but that that being loves me. Even if he isn't experiencing my experience, he cares about me and wants me to somehow thrive in this universe of love. And he doesn't need to be this person that knows everything, like many people who believe in the atonement of Christ find very great inspiration and solace in feeling like Jesus knew everything. He knew every every ache we ever had, every time we ever sneezed for Pete's sakes. He knew it all somehow. And that makes his atonement so powerful to us. If you're inspired by that, James would say, great, because that is working for you. Right. That's a truth that you can fall on. If you're not inspired by that, if you're more inspired by the idea of a God that is living with veils between all of us, we all have veils. We can't know everything about each other. Why? Because we're always in motion. We don't even know everything about ourselves. We are radically free to move on and choose every instant. God is too. And so to know everything is only to might be to know the past. And yes, we have the idea of the great psychologist who can predict the future by looking at the trends of the past. But then all of a sudden, quote unquote, something new happens, which in eternity is the only interesting thing. Because if everything was always trending, if you knew everything, why would you want to exist if you had everything nailed because you got a full trend analysis and there was no movement from it? The only thing interesting would be novelty, right? For, for Jesus, for God, or for anybody. Why would you want to sit around knowing everything? It just, it, it and, and, and therefore, we're back to this idea of what love is. And I want to answer your question by saying, Love is the mutual relationship of desires where you're always negotiating with another entity what they think the good is, the love that love requires now. And that's where it's interesting in that nexus of negotiation. Who do you choose to bring into that? And who do you choose to exclude from it? That makes it serious, right? If I could marry every girl I dated, it wouldn't be serious. I, I actually chose one and one chose me. That was serious. And, and that's what love requires of these relationships of choice where, yes, it is loving God to choose. I'm not going to focus on God this second. I'm going to focus on you. That's a way of loving God, not the divine. You're loving another person as God loves. I like to think the 93rd section of the Doctrine and Covenants teaching us how we worship and what we worship. That's very interesting if you look at the first part of that. It doesn't say we should be kneeling and doing these rituals. It talks about effectively getting the desire of God into you. Rene Girard talks about the deepest influence between humans is a nonverbal experience of another's desire and that desire moves our desire and therefore the company we keep is enormously important that decision of attention to whom do you give attention who do you read who do you listen to what do you it's it, your desires are affected by others desires and therefore to worship is to choose someone to whom you give an enormous amount of influence in your life their desires become your desires, emulating the desire of God. You can't do what God does. You can't do, what would Jesus do? Well, that's not the question. You're, you're not Jesus. The answer, the question is always, what would you do with the desire of love that you feel coming from God, from Jesus? That's the question, always. And so I hope I'm re re responding to your your idea of it's not so much the divine that we're channeling as 
the divines all around us and above us that we're collaborating with. We're collaborating with more or less, more or less. At any moment, we can be um, botching the project or pushing it forward. Uh, that's why I like the Book of Mormon's idea that there are only two churches. I think it's a for those of you Latter Day Saints, you'll get this. If those of you aren't, there's an idea in in, uh, in the Book of Mormon that there are only two churches: Church of God and Church of the Devil. And at any moment in time, you can be a member of one or the other. <laughs> no matter what you're baptized into, you know your action at any moment in time makes you a member of this one or a member of that one. I like that because uh, it shows a fluid, fixed, uh, a fluidity to eternal life that allows, yes, for more wars in heaven as possible, but we're trying to minimize the probability of more wars in heaven, right? We're trying to, to optimize love between us in our different views of what is the best or what is the good. How we collaborate on that is always a very interesting question, worlds without end. Thanks. Um, let's go to Jody England Hansen. She asks, do you envision groups of those we would consider gods, those who have progressed further into divinity and creative power? Do you envision them wrestling and discussing the things they can't accept happening, such as the little girl getting hit by a car and considering new ways to exist and create in partnership with all of us, especially if they are focused on inviting and inspiring us to move forward in the complexity of agency and progression? I love that uh, question. Um, and... Um... With uh, many of you are going to come away, I, 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 I fear with the feeling of my utter impiety and my utter arrogance and all that stuff. I can only tell you that I worship a God that I love and that loves me and you. And I come away with William James and others with such deep, profound feelings of, of love for, for the world we're in and the calls that, that we feel in ourselves intuitively, we call it the spirit of Christ among Latter-day Saints. Uh, this is real for me. And, uh, and I, had, I happen to be the, of a temperament where my mind rationally screwed me up with classical thinking. I just couldn't believe in that kind of a God. So when I found a way of bringing both the, the ethical and the aesthetic and the rational together in, in the in bodily and social form, it just gave me such joy to believe that that was, was real and possible. So I think that's what we're going to be working on forever is optimizing more of that. And yes, I think I've never been able to say along with Leibniz that this is the best of all possible worlds. Um, and therefore, it, I, I don't find it at all impious to say that the council in heaven did not come up with the best design possible. And the way around that is to say, I believe there have been many councils in eternity many councils and that there will be many more and that trade-offs somehow are part of reality and that here and this is where it's going to be funny where we next try to fix what happened in this world where we our next learning experience we're going to find whoops there were unintended consequences for that design and it didn't get accomplished all that we thought we would. And therefore, there were real losses, real experiences of loss and, and pain. Remember William James' famous line, you can't judge any good deed, any good purpose, except ex post facto, by weighing the cries and moans of the wounded in its wake. He would talk he would say that's God's problem too, or the council of the gods, or whatever. In other words, um, there is no final fix where everybody can have the experience of love with it without a downside 
if love is the optimizing thing. Um, and that goes to the ideas of freedom and how much you intervene in the design, right? And so when we're together in the council next time, I, if I get there, maybe I'll be down in the terrestrial world fiddling around. But um, it, when you're there next, remember Randall Paul told you that there might be, even for the gods, unintended consequences of their next cool design. But make love, as long as you're in our universe and, and we're optimizing love and with our gods, where there might be others, you might hop out and find that there is actually a higher telos, higher telos uh, to what we call love. And if that's the case, you might actually impress a lot of us to, to leave and try something else. But so far in eternity, as James uh, might have written, his whole philosophy might have been titled So Far. <laughs> so far, this seems to be the optimum uh, uh, for for the for what we're working on, and and I, I would argue that as a pragmatic way in the world today, uh, you could look at both Eastern and Western thought, and Eastern thought ended up really going from I think a radical, um, amoral, if you will, reality toward an idea of compassion, a an active compassion. They didn't call it love. You don't want to be attached to anything too much, but darn it. They came up finally with the idea of the bodhisattva, you know, the person who would reject nirvana, reject the convergence, come back and help those poor souls. Well, that idea comes back. There's an active idea. I call it, I call it love. And uh, uh, that even the Eastern mode of, of thought has adopted in this world today. And I think um, even nihilists, uh, my atheistic friends, would who would reject probably any idea of inner uh, intuition that came from outside, would say, we've evolved, at least, to feel like something like altruistic love is a very high value for the species, right? And uh, and so we have with that, the problem of who gets the most of it. You know, you're, you're raised in families where you're being abused by your parents, you're raised in societies where you're being abused by the culture. You know, what do we do? Well, James would say, let's dig in, let's dig in. Don't try to solve it all. Find where your desires are, your purposes are, align with others and then act and make some difference. And if it helps you to feel like you're doing that in concert with some greater or broader, more expansive beings that care about you and are helping you and you're helping them, then so be it. That's your religious impetus. If you don't need that and you're doing, uh, doing a lot, then okay. But love, darn it. Go out and act in love. Don't pretend that it doesn't matter. Well, thank you, Dr. Paul. I think we should conclude there. Um, I think all of us are, are teeming with ideas and feelings and uh, emotions and uh, you know, broad vistas of different ways to experience life. And I know for one thing, I'm going to go read this book in its entirety and the varieties of religious experience for sure. Do you think those can be read in tandem? Uh, Should I, be. If, if you're going to do it, they could be done in tandem. Yes, you would find yeah. his first work was the varieties. His last, when I say first, and when he became a philosopher of religion, he went into the experience of people, right? He, it's the varieties of religious experience on purpose. And you'll find that book, people criticize it because it doesn't focus on doctrines. It doesn't focus on uh, religions or so social groups. Uh, which are so much part of religion. He focuses on personal experiences, but that's what he does. That's his, where he has his interest. And so, yes, you could read that and it would be a very rich book. You'd love it. Um, it's a slog. Mm. It's a delicious slog, but it's, it's a real slog. You could read a pluralistic universe in one sitting. If you know philosophy as you do, 
you could do it. You could read it in a few hours. Um, a, a, you know, a variety of religious experience. You got to read his footnotes. I mean, you can't, these are books in both books. If you don't read the footnotes, you're, you're missing a lot too. So it's, this is not a casual read, but I don't want to scare you away from it. Um, um, keep, pl- keep going and it's, it, you'll find these gems and then you'll want to just keep rereading the gems for a minute and see how he's challenging you. There's no safety or comfort with James. I, I don't seek that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like adventure, you know, remember that's his personality, mm. right? He wanted the bullets whizzing by his head. <laughs> mm. Well, there were many questions that were not uh, able to be answered explicitly, but I think you actually covered their questions. And so, and there were many expressions of thanks as well from everyone. So let's conclude there. Um, we really appreciate your, your enthusiasm, your uh, liveliness. We can really tell that you love this topic and that it, it really, uh, it, it's it's sunk in deep into your soul. So we appreciate this. Um, and uh, everyone, please come again uh, to Books and Bridges. And thanks again, Randy. And we'll see everyone next time. All right. Sounds like the, some of the, the, the tune came through and that's good. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so. For sure. <laughs> Not just the words. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.